Have you ever seen a beware sign? What are some of the uh, more, more common beware signs that we see in day-to-day life? Anyone? Beware of the dog, right? That's a popular one. So I, beware of, yeah, machinery, moving objects, yeah. Uh, thin, ice. <laughs> thin ice, yeah. So I got online and I looked up some. Uh, beware of the dog was, was one. Um, I even seen one that said, forget the dog, beware of the owner. I think <laughs> that one's probably most accurate. Uh, you can find whatever you want, right? You find, beware of junior high boys, beware of whatever. All very, um, very accurate. But beware signs are meant to, to do what for us? To warn us, right? Make us aware. Uh, to make us, to put us on alert. And if I'm walking down the road and I see a beware of the dog sign, first, you know, I'm thinking, are they bluffing? Uh, but all the while, I'm, you know, checking the corners of a house, scoping out the backyard, and uh, maybe even as I'm walking, maybe striding out a little bit in case this leisurely walk has to turn into an all-out sprint. Uh, but as disciples, we need to be aware of God's kingdom, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And that's the ultimate goal, right? I mean, God's kingdom, uh, to be a part of and to be in God's kingdom, to grow God's kingdom. And when we make ourselves aware of that, uh, that God's kingdom is first, it helps us to stay focused on it. Uh, lucky for us, the Word of God has quite a bit to say about the topic. And we're going to talk about today what Jesus kind of uses to display what the kingdom of God is like, and that's through parables. So I'm going to read one for you, and um, we're going to get into those a little bit more today. This is the parable of the hidden treasure and the pearl. In Matthew 13, starting in verse 44, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then then when his joy, and in his joy, went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. We think of treasures and pearls as the kingdom of heaven, and that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. When I think about that, and I think that I have an opportunity at one of those pearls. I have an opportunity at that hidden treasure. And it's not because of how good I am. I know that. I'm jacked up. But it's how good Jesus Christ is in me, and what he's done for me in my life uh, changed me completely. And now we have an opportunity at that, and so do you. We accept him. Uh, So let's pray. God, we do thank you so much for that opportunity that you give us uh, to be in heaven with you, Lord. You bridge that gap that we could never get across. Uh, so for that, Lord, we are forever thankful. And Father, we pray as, as we go, uh, you would give us courage uh, to spread the kingdom of God, uh, to tell about the good things that you've done for us, Lord, and to use that story to, uh, to get others to... Uh, consider, Lord, just to consider how good you are, because we know if they do, they're going to find you, God. Uh, We thank you for being there for us, Lord. Uh, So I pray for Brian as he gives us your message today, Father. I pray that you hide it in our hearts. Uh, And Lord, once again, we just say thank you so much for uh, for what you've done for us, for who you are and what you are in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we're sharing about discipleship, this morning I want to share uh, from the book of John, the Gospel of John, at, and this is at the uh, Last Supper, and Jesus has just uh, uh, sent uh, uh, Judas to, to go what he needs to do. It's found in John, the 13th chapter, verses 34 and 35. And interesting here that this is, is something that Jesus shares not only with his disciples at the time, but for each and every one of us today. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Our Lord was observing his last meal with his disciples. From the table he took the bread and the fruit of the vine, the two most common articles of diet in his day, and he gave thanks, and he gave them, and he gave thanks and gave them to his friends. 
We note that Jesus did not choose symbols that would be difficult to find or obtain. Rather, he took the most simple and common of, of all for his table of memory. We observe that he did not establish a formal ritual, but he planted a concept and employed the common meal of friendship for his purpose. Let us remember always that we cannot be his friends unless we are friends of each other in the bond of Christian fellowship. We therefore rejoice in his wisdom in preserving this table for us. In turn, we would give our Lord cause for rejoicing by faithfully presenting ourselves to him in worship. We best participate in this service of communion when we meet together in Christian love and knowledge and honestly commit ourselves to his service. That song says, learning to lean on Jesus, and that's uh, hopefully what we're doing every day, is learning just a little bit more to lean on who Jesus is. The song also says that in doing so, we find more power than we've ever dreamed. And it's not a power that comes from ourselves or even a power that's to be used for personal reasons, but it's a power to be used to build the kingdom. The marks of a disciple, as we talk about them, are, are many. We're going we're gonna to be preaching for a while down this trek, and I hope you're keeping track and maybe uh, uh, taking a few notes or, or just tucking this away. As we walk through the book of Luke, uh, we see the marks of a disciple. If, if I'm going to follow Jesus, what is my, what is my life I almost said my wife. What does my life really look like? And uh, so we're going to dive into that. But first, I want to take you to a passage of Scripture in Luke, the 8th chapter. Just two Scriptures long, so you know it's going to be a short sermon. Um, just two Scriptures long, but it's an interesting couple of Scriptures uh, as Jesus speaks to our hearts today. And uh, I, I hope that your heart is open uh, I hope it's not hardened. What worship is designed to do for us is very simply to, to lay down the hardness that this life puts on us and to open our hearts to the Holy Spirit's work, to engage in His Word and let Him breathe into us the breath of life. My prayer for you today. But in the middle of this, Jesus has just told the parable about the sower. Now, you know what the parable about the, of the sower is about, probably. It's about, about a man going out to plant a garden, and he sows seed. He casts it liberally wherever he may. It falls on a lot of interesting places, and we won't describe that so much today. But he tells this parable, and then Jesus says something interesting just before what we have marked out in our scriptures as the ninth verse. He calls out to them after he shares this parable and he says, whoever has ears, okay, little sound check there, reach up, you know, well, you remember when you were a kid and you used to say to your children, uh, point to your nose, and what would they do? No, they wouldn't grab their ear, Josiah. When you said point to their nose, what would they do? Yeah, okay, point to your nose, and you say stuff like point to your eyes, what would they do? Some of you aren't participating, that's Okay. Then you say, thanks, Kendra. It's always good to have you home. Uh, then Jesus, you know, in this situation, Jesus is saying, hey, hey, children, hey, kids, guess what? No matter what age you are, when Jesus says, do you got ears? It's time to reach up. Just remind yourself, yeah, yeah, I do. And that's what Jesus says. Are you ready to hear? He sat down with his disciples and his disciples in verse Verse 9 of Luke, the 8th chapter, his disciples ask him what the parable meant. doesn't seem like it means much, but his disciples took the next step and asked him, what does the parable mean? And Jesus said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to others I speak in parables so that, catch this, though seeing, they may not see. Though hearing, they may not see. They may not understand. Are you confused? Does it make you think? Does it make you step back a little bit with Jesus' answer there? Let's pray. Father, this morning we come to you as little children uh, seeking to follow, seeking to know, and seeking to live for you. Now, Lord, if there be one here that just to your spirit needs to move, uh, may you move deeply and richly. Father, may you break up hard soil. Father, 
May, may you, uh, in hearing today through your word, may you break up hard hearts and Lord, help us to see and hear and know that you are God. Lord, help us, help us, Father, to stop fighting for worldly things. Help us to stop clamoring for the things this world provides and then takes away. Lord, help us to start trusting in your promise, in your truth, in your life, so that we might truly live and not just exist or survive. May we, Father, as disciples, uh, seek you with all our hearts and your kingdom first. And Lord, whatever you add to us will be enough because of who you are in our lives. Lord and Savior, in Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus uses parables, and I want to, I want to show you a little bit why Jesus uses parables. And, uh, and, and then we need to start thinking about how to understand them. And there's one thing you need to know about the parables is understanding Jesus' parables and Jesus' teaching is a lot like understanding the Bible. The parables, like the Bible, are very simple and yet incredibly complex. Have you ever, have you ever stopped to think about it? Uh, a lot of times the message of the Bible is incredibly simple, but then as you really begin to dive in and dig deeper, it gets complex. There are a lot of truths on the surface that Jesus wants us to grasp and find, things that everyone can comprehend, but the real riches are really found by digging deep into, into God's Word. And the deeper you dig, the great thing about the Bible is the deeper that you dig, the more treasure you find, and the more treasure you find, the closer you get to the heart of God and the heart of Jesus. Not just simply because you have treasure, but you find that you are treasured by God. I think that's an amazing truth of the Bible. And, and so the disciples sit down and ask Jesus, why do you speak in parables? These guys, these guys have been following Jesus closely. They've been living with him, and yet they're confused by some of Jesus' words. Have you ever been there? Have you joined that club? Do you wear the t-shirt? I do. The multitudes were also confused by the parables of Jesus. And, and so we asked the question, Jesus, why don't you just tell us straight out? And why don't you just tell us plainly? And in these few little verses here, Jesus explains his purpose for using parables. And the answer may shock you. Maybe it already has. See, Jesus has just told them this parable about the four different kinds of soils, and they say, Jesus, we have no clue what you're talking about, and they ask him what it means, and he gives them the answer in Luke 8, 11 through 15. So don't think that Jesus doesn't give the ultimate answer that they ask for, but here in Luke 8, 9, Luke doesn't record us for us that the apostles also ask why Jesus insists on teaching in parables. There's a parallel account to this in Matthew, the 13th chapter, and we do read that the apostle asked the question, and Matthew 13, 10 says, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus gives them a longer answer than we find in Luke, but basically it's the same answer. Jesus says to them, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to others I speak in parables so that, though seeing, they may not see. You catch that? They see it, but they don't really see it. They, good. They hear it. One guy's got it, all right? They hear it. But Jesus said, I speak to him in parables that he, even though they hear it, they don't necessarily understand. So let me ask you that question. Why does Jesus do that? This is going to be a longer sermon than I thought. Let's get to babies, okay? This is really good. Maybe it's good. Let's talk about some of babies' first words. What are some of the babies' first words that we long to hear, right? I love participation. That's what makes this work. Babies' first words, what are some of them? Mama. Why do we always go through? Daddy is first, right? Okay. No, it's not. Okay. Okay. Mama, dada, what else? What are baby's first words? No. no. Okay, we got that one down. Okay, a few more. Let's progress. 
their vocabulary begins to expand and they're playing with toys and their friend is there. You have a little infant toddler playtime and, and what's the next word they learn? What is usually accompanied by the word mine? What, what action? Huh? <laughs> Somebody's getting whacked. Okay? Because that is mine. That is mine. Hey, I want you to grasp this. What, what Jesus is trying to teach these people is sometimes that when we are busy building our own kingdom, when it's all mine, 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 we cannot see, touch, taste, enjoy, comprehend the kingdom of God. And the greatest thing that Jesus came to do in your and my life is not only the forgiveness of sin, but he came to usher us into his kingdom. When Jesus came to people and he started talking to them, he said to them, the kingdom of heaven is near you. And Jesus wanted to teach them something very important. And so sometimes we struggle with this, but we have to make a personal choice on whose kingdom we're going to build. And if we're so busy building and protecting our own, we will never, ever touch, taste, see, feel, inherit the kingdom that he really desires for us. And that's why Jesus says it's not about religion. It's not about being, you being religious enough or good enough or knowing enough or being able to defend what is yours or protect, you know, the underarm, or underarm old underarm commercial. Under, I got to slow down. Do you know the old underarm commercial? I brushed my teeth this morning. I can't do a thing with them. You know what it says? You remember what it was? We must protect. You guys are culturally unaware, all right? You guys got to get out more often. We must protect this house. I, that one grabbed me. I, we must protect this house. And sometimes when we're busy protecting our house, guess what we miss out on? Our Father's house. The life that He so wants to impart to us. So here in Luke 9, He gives us this answer and He says, you know what? I'm putting the parable teachings about the kingdom of God out there. It's kind of like preaching on a Sunday morning. I'm putting it out there, but guess whose choice it is to engage in it and incorporate it and get something out of it? You know, it's not my job. I, I love you all, but it's not my job to entertain you. Okay? It, it's not even my job to draw you in. If, if you're not connected to the Holy Spirit, and if you're not intent on seeking the kingdom of God, guess what? You probably won't ever find it. God says you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Are you there today? Did you come here all, all in, all hearted? That's the question that Jesus asks and, and his own disciples. He, he deals with them on this and he gives it to them straight. So Jesus says, I, I speak in parables so that they can see, but they can't really see. I speak in parables so they can hear, but they can't really understand. And now we know why Jesus told these stories, but the answer doesn't really help us much. It only gives us more, more questions. How many, uh, how many of you like questions? I'm going to put both my hands in my pocket. What's the number one dreaded question in the United States of America? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> What's for supper or where? That's my wife. What's for supper or where are we going for supper? Man, just somebody pick a place. I don't care what it is. You make it. You fix it. I'll eat it, you know? And if, and if I don't like it, oh, I'll complain a little bit, but that's okay, all right? You know, we think about it. You know, the question that a lot of people ask right after this parable is kind of a misguided question. Some people ask the question, why would G Jesus intentionally confuse people? But he's not intentionally confusing anyone. The parables aren't supposed to be confusing. But if they aren't, why can't we understand them always? Don't they mean something? Now listen, I want to tell you this. This is, this is some really deep theology here. If you've never been confused by scripture or a parable, it's not because you're ignorant. Okay? I want to let you off the hook. 
Now, a teacher is supposed to make sense. But in Luke 8, the 10th chapter, he says, seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. And, and Jesus explains it in much more detail in Matthew, the 13th chapter, as to why he speaks into parables. But ultimately, it's so that parables reveal truth to some, but at the same tr time, hide truth to others. Now, are you a little more concerned now than you were before? Are you a little more aware? So you're telling me that Jesus gives truth, reveals truth to some of us, but at the same tr time hides truth from others? Keep asking questions. See, Jesus often spoke in parables when there were multitudes of people listening, large groups. And in such situations, he wanted to instruct the believers in the group but he wanted to veil some of the truth from the unbelievers in the group. And the question is this, why would a master teacher like Jesus veil the truth when unbelievers are around? You ever ask that question? How many of you have been given some truth that you were not ready to receive? Anybody? You know, all you have to do is walk into a classroom of third graders. And they will tell you if you smell. They will tell you that there's a zit on the end of your nose. They will tell you you're fat, bald, and ugly if they need to, right? They don't care. They just tell it like it is, right? How many of you want to hear that truth today? Okay? Now listen to this. There's a compassionate reason why Jesus sometimes veils the truth. To those that don't believe. Sometimes, most of the time, it's because it's a truth they're not ready to receive. And the main truth an unbeliever needs to hear is that, first of all, they need, they need eternal life that's received through faith in Jesus Christ. And though it, it does happen mainly in John, this truth is rarely presented in parable form. But when Jesus wants to tell unbelievers to believe in him for eternal life, guess what? More often than not, in fact, 99% of the time, Jesus just flat out tells them. Look at scripture. There are never, to my knowledge, any parables that hide the truth about receiving eternal life by trusting in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. However, the more advanced truths about the kingdom of heaven are reserved for those who have already believed, who are willing and eager to learn them. So when Jesus speaks about the truths about the kingdom of heaven, he speaks in parables. And whether a person is a believer or an unbeliever, two things will happen. Either the person will come to him and ask for an explanation or go away thinking about what was just said. You ever, been to a, you ever been to a sermon on a Sunday morning and all you remembered was the joke that the preacher told at the beginning of the story to kind of draw you in? Uh, I have a group of friends on Monday. We meet out, we meet out at the boat and uh, we sit out at the table out there and we have lunch and I get to see a lot of folks out there on Mondays um, and it's really kind of, it's really kind of a fun fellowship thing. Now, none of us are there to go gamble away our inheritance or anything like that. But on, on Mondays, just to let you in on a little secret, if you're 50 years or older, you get a half price buffet. And that's a pretty good deal, even if it does come from the devil, okay? Okay. Don't accept Satan's bargains. Let me get past that. Okay. But I want, you to think, I want you to think about this. We sit down, and a lot of times, the only question they ask about my sermon on Sunday, you know what the only question is they ask? What was the joke of the day at church yesterday? And I, I choke on my chicken bone, and I regurgitate the joke, and we all laugh and go home happy. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing. But what Jesus really deeply desires and honestly wants is for us to break through the superficial of life and get to the deeper questions. 
And so Jesus, as a master teacher, provides an opportunity for people to ask him questions. You see, sometimes Jesus wanted people to come to him individually for explanations about his parables. And if he did and they were an unbeliever, he would first share the simple gospel with them about who he was and what he desired for the life. Like with Nicodemus in John the third chapter. But if the person was a believer, Jesus would sit down and explain to them the hidden truth of the parable. And that's what he does here in Luke, the 8th chapter, when his disciples come and they do something significant. What do they do after Jesus tells the parable? His disciples gather around Jesus, and what do they do? They ask. That's the first key to, to unlocking. It's, it's really simple, and it's found in Matthew 7. Jesus tells us the key, keys for unlocking his kingdom if we'll just engage and the problem is we live in a society that oftentimes allows us to disengage and to isolate and insulate ourselves from everything that is most healthy and to hide privately in areas that are most unhealthy. Jesus invites you, if you've got a question, no matter what it is, ask him. The second thing he encourages you to do is to, to seek him. We've already said it before. Scripture tells us very simply, if we seek God with all our hearts, we will find him. God is not seeking to hide himself from anyone, but to reveal himself to everyone. But he gives us a choice. Isn't that a beautiful thing? He is a just God. He gives us a choice. He doesn't force his way in. He doesn't kick the door down. He simply stands at the door of our heart and he knocks. And if we open it, guess what Jesus says he'll do? He'll come in and, and he will lavish his time and his wisdom and his heart on us. But in this sense, in, in Matthew 7, Jesus tells us to do the knocking. Have you ever gone out and knocked on doors for your church or anything like that? Have you ever done one of those little little things where you go out and just say, I'm going to go, go invite some people to church that I haven't invited for a long time. And you sit in your car, and you say, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And am I going to do this? Okay? And you get up to the door, and you say, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Ah, they're probably not home. You walk away. Okay? Have you ever done cold calls like that? How many of you are sick and tired of the robo calls you get from the election? Word? It's just beginning, okay? But when we see something, how do you react when you see somebody you know at the door of your house? How do you react? <laughs> okay, let me rephrase that question. <laughs> Valid point. When you, <laughs> when you see somebody that you love to see, <laughs> when Sally's sitting on the doorstep and she's got a pie in her hand, what do you do with that stinking door? Man, I could rip it off the hinges. I can't even rip it off the hinges fast enough to get that pie, you know? I mean, or, or Karen's pies, you know? Did you see those sell the other night? Oh, yeah. It's good stuff, you know? When you know you're, you're willing to take away any obstacle in the way to get to what you love. And that's what Jesus is talking about here in terms of the kingdom of God. Are you removing the obstacles? Are you building the walls? Parables, very simply, are important ways that Jesus used to teach. But he also used it to raise awareness that we might come after what we really want to find out. Okay? Church is easy. You can just walk in the door and plop down in a pew. And everything happens kind of right in front of you. You can follow along and participate if you want to. And if you don't want to, well, you can just check out real easy. But that's not what Jesus wants. Jesus doesn't want you to go to church. He wants you to worship him as Savior and Lord of his life. He wants you to come to him, not religiously, but relationally, and find out what he desires from you. So we learned that the parables are about the kingdom of heaven, and that's the purpose of the parables. The purpose of the parables is to teach us things about the kingdom of heaven. 
All the parables concern, and Jesus often starts many of his parables by saying the kingdom of heaven is like. And it's crucial to remember that the kingdom of heaven is not heaven itself, but the kingdom of heaven is the rule. Check this out. The kingdom of heaven is the rule and reign of God on earth, so that is what is done in heaven is also done on earth. The Lord one time was asked, how should we pray? Now, I think this is important for us to understand. The Lord was asked, how should we pray? And so Jesus gave his followers a model prayer. He didn't say, this is what you should pray every time you're together. This is the only thing that makes church significant if we say this prayer. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. And he says a lot of really, really interesting and amazing things in the Lord's Prayer. One of the things he says is, for, and he tells us to pray on a daily basis, is thy kingdom come. What does that mean? God, I want you to rule and reign in my life day by day, on earth as it is in heaven. For now and for eternity, God, reign. And when Jesus came near, God in flesh came near to humanity. He said, folks, listen, do you hear it? Do you see it? Do you know it? The kingdom of heaven is near. The question is, do you choose it? I've often said, if you believe in Jesus Christ and you trust him with all your heart, this world is as close to hell as you'll ever have to get. But if you don't accept that Jesus Christ is both Lord and Savior of your life, this world is as close to heaven as you'll ever get. And you can choose to live with that. But God says, I wish you'd choose so much more. See, God never sends us to hell. We choose it wherever we're at. In the kingdom of heaven, I want to remind you today that because of Jesus' death on the cross, because of his resurrection, his conquest of death, because of that, very simply, the kingdom of heaven is near and it's real to you and I. And he's building it in our hearts if we will let him. Don't let your heart be hardened. The kingdom of heaven is bringing the rule and the reign of God to earth. And folks, would you say with me today that we need more God here in this earth? Do we need more God in America today than ever before? I think it's really pretty simply true. And one day Jesus is going to come back and he's going to say, enough. Let's get it right. And he's going to make everything right. But until then, we have the choice to participate in his kingdom or build our own. Yes, we do. <laughs> So very simply, the parables teach us, and again, catch this, uh, wrap up here really quickly, so hang with me. The parables teach us what life looks like when God rules and reigns in our lives, when we live on earth. It teaches us how to behave, how to think, and what to do as members of the kingdom of heaven, as children of the king. It teaches us how to live. The parables are about the kingdom of heaven. But a second thing that's important to know, if you're going to unlock the purpose of the parables is that you need to know the actions and the attitudes of the audience. And this is a whole context issue. Have you ever jumped into a, a conversation and not had the context of it? What can happen really quickly? <laughs> so you jump on Facebook, and all of a sudden you see this one-line thing on Facebook. You don't know the context of it or anything. What usually happens in, in the middle of that? Things get said, people get accused, fingers get pointed, pictures get posted, and it all unravels pretty quickly and breaks down, doesn't it? Isn't it great? Hey, you remember when we used to get, get together and talk to each other face to face and nose to nose? It's, I, I think technology is wonderful, don't get me wrong. I think technology is wonderful, don't get me wrong. But there is, there is no substitute for what Jesus did with people. He got face to face and nose to nose with him. Jesus, the Son of God, had three and a half years to ministry. And you know what the most important priority of his day was? 
Prayer, connection with the Father, and people. Connecting with people. And when you see Jesus really honestly connecting with people, he didn't always desire the crowds and multitudes that gathered, but he oftentimes sought out people to get nose-to-nose with, face-to-face with, and remind them of a simple truth. God loves you more than you can imagine. Even though life is tough, he's got an offer for you that's so much better. And he's willing to die so that you can live. That's how much God loves you. So the context of it all, of the parable, is, is look at who Jesus is talking to and who he's telling the parable to. Look around and see what activity has just taken place or what words have been said. Frequently, Jesus will use a parable, catch this, oftentimes Jesus uses a parable to correct people's theological shortcomings. That's a fancy way of saying Jesus kind of teaches us what to do when we're not doing it right with parables. And a lot of times it was stories that had things that people could relate to and and people could understand, and, and sometimes there's a little bit of a smile in the parables as Jesus taught. Sometimes the actions and the attitudes of the audience won't be very clear from the text, and you may have to get into some other Bible study tools to help, some background commentaries and things that aid you like that. But the more you know about the audience Jesus is talking and about the time they lived in and how they thought, the more sense that the parables will make to you. Once you know the audience, you can look for the, and here's the thing, look for the spiritual lesson that Jesus is trying to teach. And ask, ask, ask. Seek, seek, seek. Knock, knock, knock. And the door will be opened. But let me give you this. In all of Jesus' parables, there is a spiritual sting. If you have a soft, warm, fuzzy, cuddly truth from a parable, chances are you misunderstood the parable. Most of Jesus' parables have sharp points to them. These stories of Jesus, Jesus isn't merely seeking to tantalize or educate his hearers. He's wanting to challenge them at a fundamental level on the surface. Oftentimes, as Jesus tells these stories, they seem harmless. They seem charming, little narratives full of familiar images that capture our attention. But in, in reality, they're, they're kind of like a stealth bomber, specially designed to evade your psychological defenses. And they squirm their way inside your mind in spite of every barricade you can seek to erect. And, and then they drop a highly explosive charge targeted at the most vulnerable point of our spiritual laziness. It's often a characteristic of these stories is that they have a sting in the tail. <laughs> T-A-L-E, if you got that one. That was for you, Andy. Okay. If you want to follow somebody fun on Facebook, follow Andy and his puns. I, I groan every day. I have grown every day that I read your prayer. Okay, anyways, we'll carry on. Okay. But the stories of Jesus are just like that oftentimes in the stories of the Bible. And I want you to remember it. Remember when the prophet Nathan went to confront David about Bathsheba? Do you remember that? David commits a, adultery with Bathsheba. And Nathan goes and, and tells him a story about a rich man who had lots of sheep and he took the only lamb of a poor man. And of course, David was outraged that such a thing could happen in his kingdom. And that's when Nathan said, Oh, David, you are that man. You see, the story got David to see his sin in a way that he wouldn't have seen it otherwise. And this is how Jesus works in our life to confront us with the things of the kingdom that maybe we wouldn't always be seeking for. Maybe we wouldn't always ask for or be knocking about. The story that Nathan told David had a punchline that really hurt. And the parables of Jesus oftentimes are no different because Jesus wants to understand we spend so much time trying to build and protect and defend what is ours. That sometimes we rip the very life that Jesus gave us away from him and we say, mine. And in doing so, in doing so, we reject the very one who can save us. You think about it. It 
really becomes true. There is, there's a man in Scripture, he's, he's called the rich young ruler. He was called that because he literally had everything. God had given him everything. Good job, good family, good living, good house. All the right stuff. Religiously, he had done all the right things. And, and, and one day he encounters Jesus and he says, you know, what does it take to follow you? And Jesus looks at him and he says, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And come follow me. The man whom Jesus loved, by the way, went away really sad because he, had, he thought he had so much. But he walked away from Jesus. Let me contrast that with some fishermen on a shore where Jesus stepped up and said, come follow me. Remember what Peter, his brother, and some other disciples did when Jesus said, come follow me? They left everything behind. They left homes and businesses that they had built over years. They left family behind. They left everything to follow Jesus because they understood eventually that he was the only one that could give them anything that really mattered. You understand that we're knit together as a body of Christ to build a kingdom that's not our own? To encourage people to come to a savior that we need just as much as they do? To encourage people to stop looking at this, this little speck on the timeline that we call life and start looking at eternity. And Jesus invites us today, very simply, to come away and follow him, to step into his kingdom. And you know the great thing is? The moment we do, he makes us a child of a king, his son and his daughter. Today we invite you to that. We're just going to sing this one last song as we close today. And it says this, and I hope you can sing it with your heart and, and not just your head or just not with your, just your lips. I hope today you can sing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. I hope you can sing that with all your heart because you know it. If you don't know it, hey folks, we'd love to sit down eyeball to eyeball with you and talk more about what that faith journey looks like. We'd love to introduce you to Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life. It's really simple. It's a free gift of God. All you have to do is come to terms with the fact that He is who He is and believe it. Confess that, that there is a God and you're not Him. To decide in your heart to stop walking and building your own kingdom, start building His. To bury yourself in baptism and to walk by faith. That's what Jesus calls us to, to trust in his promises. Will you stand with me if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Would you please stand with me and sing this song? If you don't believe, you can stand up along with us, but we'd encourage you to come.